Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. So this week, Minnesota State Trooper Ryan Londrigan made his first court appearance on murder, manslaughter and assault charges. It stems from this deadly traffic stop encounter with Ricky Cobb the second last summer on I-94. Now, there are a lot of emotions, a lot of facts at play here. We thought this would be a really good opportunity to bring in uh, our Paul Bloom and sort of open up his reporter's notebook on this. You've been covering it since the beginning to talk about some of these key issues, Paul, and then give us a look at where the case is going to go from here. So first of all, could you set the scene for us? This latest court hearing, Londrigan's first court appearance, and then I understand there's some new details that we just learned today. Yeah, some late breaking uh, news from the courthouse Thursday afternoon on some new court filings. We'll certainly get into that. But yes, yeah, so let's start with uh, Trooper Ryan Londrigan's first court appearance just a few days ago. Again, charged murder, manslaughter, and assault. What was really interesting about this one to, uh, earlier this week was the amount of law enforcement support that showed up to basically have Trooper Longigan's back. We hadn't seen that, right? I've covered Chauvin, the three others with George Floyd, Kim Potter. Now, those maybe, maybe happened uh, during the pandemic, but we hadn't seen that, uh, um, you know, massive law enforcement support that says, no, we're not okay with these charges. So that was your, your sort of first observation as you kind of stepped in. It's at the public safety facility. So basically the jail facility and here, you're taking a look at sort of that news conference. Look at all that law enforcement support uh, behind Trooper Longigan right there, who's holding his wife's hand uh, outside the public safety facility. So that was one. The other interesting observation, so while law enforcement and Trooper Longigan supporters were on one side of this very small courtroom inside the jail, on the other was Ricky Cobb's loved ones, mom, sister, their civil attorney, a national civil attorney uh, by the name of Bakari Sellers. They have plans to eventually sue monetary damages. But make no mistake, they want uh, justice in this case. They want to see this trooper prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. They want him going to prison for taking their brother, their sons, their cousin's life. Obviously now, Amy, this case plays out in a court of law. Okay, so let's talk about the decision to charge here. What did this come down to for Hennepin County Attorney Mary Moriarty? A lot of questions, you know, and it depends what side you, you come down on it. Law enforcement says this is a bad prosecution. What happened on that uh, on that highway, I-94, early in the morning, July 31st, last summer? Yes, it was tragic. No one wants to have a loss of life. But those troopers had a standing order to arrest Ricky Cobb. He was wanted on a violation of an order for protection. So you you begin with this traffic stop and we'll eventually get to the body camera and the dash camera videos. But what Mary Moriarty said at a news conference was to my question, I asked her specifically, Mary, there are gonna be people in this community who are gonna look at that as a legal traffic stop, right? Uh, Ricky Cobb the seconds car had no taillights, 2.30 in the morning, so it stopped, legal stop. And then all of a sudden they run his name. He's wanted on this violation for an order for protection out of Ramsey County. Now all of a sudden they are authorized to make the arrest. And then what happens in those moments in and around that vehicle is what's under question here. The Hennepin County Attorney's Office says it's unintentional murder. They've charged it that way. And what Moriarty said to me in answering this question was this was all about the state troopers training. Hmm. Take a listen to what she said that day we focused on is the training that the state troopers received. The training that the state troopers received was about making decisions when there's a traffic stop. They are not allowed to shoot at a car which is driving away. They're not allowed to shoot someone to prevent the car from driving away. They are only allowed to use deadly force if it will prevent great bodily harm or death to their partner or somebody else. So we focused on the training that they received. And they also, as I said, received training that shooting someone, in fact, my understanding is they have a video that they show that someone who was shot in the head continued to drive away. So the training that they received, very extensive training by the state patrol, was that shooting someone was not likely to cause the person to stop driving. So shooting someone was not a, an appropriate or necessary use of deadly force in this situation. Okay, Paul, so on that same day, you spoke with the defense for Trooper Londrigan, and they had some pretty strong criticism of Mary Moriarty and these charging decisions. Well, they frankly see this as a political decision to prosecute. They don't see, they certainly don't see a crime here. And, and 
Trooper Lange again is represented by Chris Maddle, one of two attorneys, Peter Wold's the other. Maddle, let's just say he's a fighter. Uh, he's going to throw these bombs out there. But certainly within minutes of Mary Moriarty filing these charges, the defense motion to dismiss was already in the court system. They questioned Moriarty's uh, decision, you know, her comments about uh, that they did not face great bodily harm or death. They could have been dragged on that freeway, says the state troopers legal team. But, but the language that was used, this clearly is a public uh, relations battle. I think that's taking shape, right? I think the um, attorneys for police officers have seen sort of the roadmap, the blueprint of other cases. They want to win uh, at least uh, sort of the argument in, 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 as it relates to the public at large. So take a look at this, uh, this sound bite. Now, this is a video handout, Amy. I want to point it out. This is not during an interview. This is just the lawyer's comments, Chris Maddell, immediately following Mary Moriarty's decision to charge Super Lange again. This county attorney has provided sweetheart deals to murderers and kidnappers, and now, today, she charges a hero. This county attorney is literally out of control. Open season on law enforcement must end, and it's going to end with this case. Wow, yeah, some pretty strong words there. I think this might be a good time, Paul, to actually take a closer look at this traffic stop with the caveat that there's a lot we don't know yeah. here, right? Do you want to walk us through that? Right, we do have the video. It, it's uh, we're, we're keeping it in chronological order. Obviously, there are some other cameras we didn't have access to. This was released in the, in the days that followed this deadly traffic stop. Three troopers are on scene, and this one who's walking up, this is Trooper Brett's side, so this is not launch against camera. This is the initial traffic traffic stop. This is Trooper side speaking with Ricky Cobb at the steering wheel. What's unclear to me at this point is whether the car remains in drive or whether Cobb has put it in park. He certainly has his foot on the brake there. It's not moving. And, and this is where the discussion, you know, I know our viewers have probably seen this a couple of times, you know, what's going on. Uh, Cobb questions. He wants to know. He wants to talk to an attorney. And here are the three troopers on the side. This is Trooper Lonjergan's angle. He goes in opens that door, tries to physically get at Cobb, side on the other side, also trying to get at Cobb. The car starts to roll the way the prosecutors wrote in the criminal complaint. Cobb takes his foot off the brake, and then that's Trooper Lange again firing twice, and then Cobb's vehicle rolls, you know, a quarter mile. Unfortunately, tragically, he's been fatally wounded, um, so that car ends up crashing, and here's the state patrol rushing in and then trying to protect, uh, provide some medical aid. Obviously, he died uh, from those injuries. He was shot twice, kind of in the chest, torso area from the side. Again, you know, we haven't talked directly to Cobb, but from the court filings, excuse me, we haven't talked directly to Longigan, but from the court filings from his attorney, he was scared that he could have been dragged down that freeway. He was scared that trooper side on the driver's side could have been dragged. They both basically were physically in or pretty close to being inside the, the cabin of, uh, of Cobb's vehicle. So that's what a jury is going to have to look at. We're going to, you know, you heard Moriarty talk about, um, uh, help me out. The, well, there's procedural issues, right? Procedural, right? The training. I mean, like, the training. what are they trained yeah. to do? She said over and over yes. about how they know how to extricate a suspect from a car because a car could be a dangerous, dangerous, deadly weapon, right. and they're trained how to do that properly. She didn't. She didn't go deeper other than to say it's all about their training. So clearly, we will hear from the trainers at an eventual trial. Mm -hmm. But it, it does come down to what was Trooper Longigan trained to do. Did they act properly? And if they didn't, this county attorney believes what happened next was, was murder, was manslaughter, was first degree assault. She thinks she can get a conviction on those charges or else she doesn't charge. So here we are. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because her office said that they would employ this third party use of force expert. That didn't end up happening. So why? And then I can't imagine that sitting well with the troopers legal team. It, it does not. And it certainly opens the questions because Back in September, when they took over the case file from the BCA, right, the, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, does um, the initial investigation. They talk to the troopers. They talk to the relevant people. They scrub through the body camera. They scrub through the dash camera. And then they present their findings to the county attorney's office. When the county attorney accepted that case file from the BCA, it is now up to that office 
to make the charging decision. And what happened there was when they put out a public statement, they said a couple of things, Amy, you may remember this. They said, one, they did not get full cooperation from some critical State Patrol employees. We didn't know what that meant. We didn't know if that was the other troopers who were at the scene. We didn't know if that was sort of the, the State Patrol folks who do the training, who would have trained Ryan Lonjigan. So they said they didn't get cooperation. And then the second thing that they said, um, the second thing, remind me what the second thing they said, I'm, I'm blanking now, but, uh, oh, was this idea that we would use a use of force oh, yes, expert. Yes, yes. The use of force expert. They said they were going to use one. Mm -hmm. They said they had one ready to go. But then all of a sudden, when we got the criminal complaint, you know, six months later, five months later, there was no use of force expert. And I, we asked Mary about that at, the, at her news conference uh, announcing these charges. And she said basically that her office was able to make their own conclusions and get to these charges without the need of a use of force expert. So if you're on the other side, you're wondering, well, did a use of force expert uh, look at this case initially and didn't see charges? Mm -hmm. And then you said, okay, well, we don't need your services. Were they, did they really just want to take a closer look amongst their own lawyers and realize maybe they got out in front of their skis, if you will, yeah. by saying that initially? We don't know, but there is uh, some comments uh, from Trooper Longigan's attorney, again, Chris Maddell, after the first uh, court appearance. He's got this huge crowd of law enforcement behind him. And he says, hey, Mary, where's your use of force expert? I have nearly 100 guys behind me willing to tell you what, the, what their opinions are on the use of force in that moment. Here, take a listen from that, uh, from that news conference. So on September 19, uh, 2023, the county attorney started this case by saying that they had retained a use of force expert and that that use of force expert was critical with respect to the charging decision. And then last week, we found that when Trooper Ryan Londrigan was charged, they didn't use a use of force expert. Standing behind me is about 100 different current and former police officers. Here's a bunch of use of force experts. All she needs to do is email me and I'll hook her up with one. I really want to thank everybody for showing up here for this great showing of support for Trooper Ryan. And it means the world not only to Alondragans, but Mr. Wold and myself. So thank you so much for showing up and we appreciate it. Onward with the case. And you can see there the support that he has, but certainly it gets at the issue. What happened to this use of force expert? Yeah. And they really, they really want to know if there's someone out there. And, uh, you know, if this eventually gets to trial, I mean, you could see the defense certainly calling a use of force expert or yeah. two to say, look, that was a life and death situation. They were authorized to make that arrest. Mm -hmm. And when that car starts moving and their lives they feel are in danger, Trooper Longigan is entitled to fire. He didn't open fire. He didn't go crazy with his bullets, right? It was two shots. Uh, obviously, you know, the car continued to drive away, but Trooper Side and Trooper Longigan walked home from that, uh, you know, went home, uh, suffered a couple of like dragging minor injuries from, from the incident. But, uh, you know, the defense is going to claim that uh, this is a bad charge. They've already filed motions to have it dismissed. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens if this case plays out. For several reasons, they filed the motion dismiss, to dismiss, one of them being that the county attorney's office violated the grand jury process. So tell us what that means and how it might affect the case. Right. So our viewers might uh, know about a grand jury when it comes to indictments. I think yeah. that's sort of the most obvious. And we talk about it on the news, especially when it comes to first degree murder. Yeah. In fact, uh, by law, you have to go to a grand jury. So that's, uh, that's sort of a confidential legal process. Uh, it can be, uh, it's a group of citizens, uh, sort of uh, the, the, uh, more members than a typical jury. It can be like 16 to 23 members of the community. They meet in private. Everything is sort of, um, you know, not off the record. I mean, it's documented and it can come back in statements eventually when it gets to trial. But the grand jury decides whether to indict somebody, first degree murder, uh, first degree sexual assault. That's the typical use that we certainly hear about in the news. The other thing it can do, Amy, is it just can basically be used by a prosecutor as an investigative tool. Because mm -hmm. what happens is when the BCA is investigating these police involved deadly shootings, no one is compelled to talk to the BCA. They could choose not to. It could be a myriad of reasons. One, they fear that they could be prosecuted. You know, you think about another trooper on that scene. You know, would, would Trooper Side be anxious that 
the Hennepin County Attorney's Office could be looking at him as a potential, potential, you know, a defendant because he physically went at Ricky Cobb. So there could be different reasons why you you might like the guy. You could be a friend. Like I don't want to go testify uh, against him. So you could you could decide not to to speak to the BCA. But now all of a sudden, if you call in a grand jury and now you get a subpoena, now you're compelled to testify. There are a couple reasons why you weren't. Maybe spousal privileges. There are a couple other. Uh, you, you don't. You know, again, the Constitution would protect you from self-incrimination. Uh, but beyond that, you have to respond to questions. You have to show up. And so my understanding, we don't know because it is a sort of secretive confidential process, is a grand jury was used in this case, and the county attorney does confirm that, to compel testimony from some of those non-cooperative, uncooperative state patrol employees. But what the defense sees here, they're thinking about the indictment kind of component. They kind of feel this was, quote, an end run around the grand jury. Well, if you're going to call this grand jury, you're going to bring in witnesses, then let them make the decision. Let them decide whether to indict or not. But that is something Mary Moriarty ended up doing. She made the charging decision unto herself. She says she has. So we went out last week to talk to a retired Hennepin County chief, uh, judge, Kevin Burke, just to get clarity. Does the defense have an argument here? They're going to throw everything at the wall to see what sticks. But one thing they don't like is this grand jury use and the way it went about it because it was more investigative. It was not done to seek an indictment. But here's Kevin Burke's take, again, a retired Hennepin County judge. The idea of using a grand jury to get uncooperative witnesses to give testimony is a time-honored thing in this state. And it was used in the Knorr case by Mike Freeman. So there's nothing unusual about the process that led to the charge. It can be investigative, right, a grand jury, or it can be one where you seek an indictment. Um, we have historically in Minnesota had grand juries that did investigations. And there was a point up until the late 1970s when a grand jury would issue a report. And that's been eliminated. But So now it's either you can use it for investigation and then decide whether to charge or not. It happened quite frequently with police officer shootings up until Mike Freeman made the decision, which Mary Moriarty has followed up on, which is that they would accept responsibility for the charging decision themselves. It was also used quite frequently to get rid of election law cases. Uh, but it is not, uh, it, most of the time, it's just a charging function of the grand jury in Minnesota. Yeah. Mm. Uh, at the top of the segment, we talked a little bit about some new developments today. Can you walk us through what's happened here in the last hour? Yeah, so we're Thursday afternoon. Uh, the charge, uh, first court appearance was earlier this week, and it's just a, it's a, it's one it's a one piece sheet of paper that the the prosecution filed today. The Hennepin County Attorney's Office filed, and it checked two boxes that sort of jumped out to me. The two boxes it checked. One was it sort of had to define, uh, you know, you have to kind of tell the court how you're going to go after or prosecute a case. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form that probably gets filed in most every case, but it's not something necessarily we would pay attention to. But in it, there are two boxes that the state has checked. One is that it wants to go out and prove the defendant, meaning Trooper Lange, again, he had about 18 months of service at the time, so young, you know, inexperienced trooper. But it said that it wants to go out and prove that the defendant committed other, of, other offenses in prior incidents, hmm. other offenses in prior incidents. What does that mean? Do they have body camera footage of him doing something similar that violated state patrol policy? What are they getting at there? We don't know at this point. We just don't. It's, it's a filing. The county attorney's office is not going to publicly comment on it, but we have to pay close attention to that because obviously, you know, you think about going back to like a Derek Chauvin, right? Mm -hmm. They would find prior episodes of that, you know, kneeling, the, the, the restraint and, and that type of thing. So does Trooper Longigan, you know, have a history, uh, one or two things that, that he did wrong that violated policy and they're ready to pounce on that if a judge allows it? Of course, a judge will ultimately decide. The other box that they checked was that they were going to seek an aggravated sentencing mm. if they get a conviction. What does that mean? So basically, there's what, what we call guideline sentences for any criminal offense. So this murder to unintentional, this is a serious felony. This is the type of felony that, you know, a defendant with no criminal history, 
the standard guideline sentence is anywhere from 10 and a half to 15 years in prison guidelines. So that means at the end of it, if he is convicted on that top count, you know, the judge, I mean, there's a the probation kind of looks at his, his you know, his, his, his history, his file, he does interviews with the parties, and then uh, a judge ultimately sentences somewhere in that guideline range. Judge sentence in the guideline range, there can be no appeal of that. So that, that tends to what happens in Minnesota court of law. But now what they're saying is they want aggravated sentencing. So they think, again, not, not elaborating, but they think this is more egregious. Uh, obviously, my gut would be that you know he's wearing the badge, that this shouldn't have happened. He killed under the authority of the state. They're going to see that as an aggravating factor. And if they get that conviction and when that comes before a judge, that now can escalate the amount of prison time. So let's say we're in that 10 and a half to 15 year range. Maybe that becomes 18 years. Maybe it becomes 20. I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know uh, enough about this. I don't know if we'll ever see a conviction on this case. But the fact that they're going so hard after Trooper Longigan, I mean, I think a lot of people, um, you know, writ large thought murder two is a pretty hefty charge here to begin with. So some people thought this county attorney's office was already going hard after this trooper and maybe that would be it you know one one sign where they maybe took it easy on him in recent days they didn't ask for monetary bail right. they sent him home with just some court uh, mandated uh, conditions so they charge him hard they said okay but you can stay free while this plays out but then today they go with this big punch and we're going to find prior offenses we're going to go for aggravated sentencing it shows some intensity with this mm -hmm. prosecution uh, you know we could speculate that maybe eventually used to you know try to get a plea in this case. Sure. But right now, it, it says a lot where this county attorney's office stands against prosecuting Ryan Longigan. Yeah, they're already sort of doubling down yeah. early on. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the fallout here. We're, yeah. we're going to talk about Ricky Cobb II's family. Of course, their voice really important to hear here as well. I want to ask you one more thing, though, about Trooper Londrigan, yeah. which is some safety oh, yeah. concerns as well. As you alluded, emotions are really high in this yeah. case. Yeah, and, and this was an interesting filing, again, that kind of came in the immediate aftermath of of the charges his his uh, legal team filed what, what, what we call in the in the kind of the court record world um, an affidavit and it was a little confusing it, it didn't really have a, a message to it it was just sort of this document I think it was 36 pages long with like screenshots of threats made online like vague threats like let's kill that cop who got mm. Cobb uh, uh, they, they posted his home address uh, Ryan Londrigan's home address. He's got a wife, a young child. Um, so what, what my understanding was behind the scenes is they wanted to make sure that when it came time for bail and the conditions that were going to be set, that Trooper Londrigan could hold on to his gun because his address had been posted. Uh, threats were vaguely made, certainly singled out kind of in the immediate aftermath of the police shooting. And then obviously fresh with the charges filed so they wanted to make sure he could keep his firearm mm. at his house and in the end what the judge decided and what uh, I mean the two sides kind of signed off on uh, was this idea that he could his uh, he is not allowed to transport his weapons okay. transport but that seemingly left open the door that he could keep a firearm in his house because I know there are safety concerns and you know you just don't know who is going to react but they the affidavit was filed with the court to show them his address was floating out there. Mm -hmm. Some comments, including some from Ricky Cobb's family themselves, uh, about getting him, getting revenge, those kinds of things yeah. that they wanted this court to know what was going on. So, yeah, there was a safety concern mm -hmm. for Trooper Ryan, Ryan Longigan, and he is free. There is no bail. The state did say that. They didn't necessarily uh, want bail in this, but uh, other, other, um, other aspects of the conditions of his release right now, he had to surrender his passport. He has to remain law abiding. He can't talk to witnesses in the case, so he can't kind of collaborate or you know get with Trooper side to get their story straight or anything like that. Um, and he has to make all future court appearances, pretty routine stuff. But again, no monetary bail for Trooper Longigan. Okay, and you've spent a fair amount of time around the family of yeah. Ricky Cobb uh, Jr. Tell me a little bit about how they're feeling right yeah. now um, and what are their plans moving forward? Well, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, they, they have hired a nationally known civil attorney. It's not uh, Ben Crump, yeah. you know, but uh, Bakari Sellers is also a familiar face. You'll see on uh, on the national, uh, you know, news talk shows, cable news. This is a picture of Ricky Cobb. And here are the marches. And, and there's been, you know, there have been protests. 
Uh, as for the first court appearance and the charges, the Cobbs were there. Uh, they see this as the first step in, in getting justice, of holding someone accountable. Obviously, in their action of hiring Bukhari sellers, there will eventually be some type of civil lawsuit filed. I had a chance actually to catch up with Cobb's sister, and I just uh, want to set up this uh, soundbite for our viewers because she said something about her brother being a hero. Mm. And I don't know if she explains it fully, but what she's getting at is if Ricky Cobb is not in the car where he is and the trooper fires, as it's shown on these dash cam and uh, body cameras, is that uh, her, you know, her brother took the bullet that otherwise would have hit that trooper side at the driver's side mm. door. So that's what she's talking about when she calls her brother a hero. But we'll take you uh, again. This is a scene just outside the public safety facility after Trooper Longigan's uh, first court appearance earlier this week. This is the first step in justice. We retain the lawyer from, uh, we retain the expert from uh, uh, George Floyd's case. And uh, we're just thankful to be on this journey for peace. This family is one of the strongest families I've ever been around. Ricky Cobb the second was the hero. If it wasn't where my brother was sitting in that car, he would have shot his own partner, right? My brother is the hero. And I want justice for my brother. We're coming respectfully. We don't want no drama, no violence, no nothing. Justice for Ricky Cobb II, we like will get that. I would like to be that. Too. This family is really strong and they're asking for grace. They're asking for justice and to let the process run its course. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, my Thank last you. question would just be sitting in that courtroom to be that close to that trooper. What did well, we it hurt? No, we don't no, comment. no comment on that. We're just going to get on through this process. It's going to be tough, but we'll get through it. No comment on that. Thank you, guys. It's just an, I just wanted to ask because, I mean, they're right. You know, it's a very small courtroom, so the cobs are right there. You know, Trooper Lange again is coming and going. I, I do feel it wasn't anything done by the law enforcement, but I did get the feeling that they were sort of intimidated by the turnout mm. of law enforcement that they, you know, they had to walk yeah. through that crowd outside. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know what it, you know, I know how families get upset. Yeah. It's hard for them uh, to be in the same room. That's the trooper who, you know, killed yeah. their loved one. So I, I did want to ask that question. You heard Bakari uh, kind of cut it off, but the sister did sort of say it, it hurt. And, um, you know, I, I do follow, you know, I'm connected with a couple of them on social media and they, t they, they kind of, you know, in, in their social group really asked for some extra support coming up for the hearing on April 29th yeah. when Londrigan will be back in court, basically saying law enforcement was out and Brian Londrigan supporters were there in yeah. huge numbers. And that matters. It's not going to change what happens in a courtroom, right. but, you know, on your human emotion, your psyche, what it means, um, you know, they obviously as, as vehemently as, you know, uh, Law enforcement believes what happened, while tragic, that that that, that needed to happen. The Cobb's family is, is reeling. They're grieving. They're, you know, devastated, and they feel he should have been allowed to go home. You know, you know, li live through that. Yeah. So, and also, I'm, I think it's important that his sister points out. You know, they're looking for peaceful, uh, you know, moving forward because you yeah. can anticipate that there might be more law enforcement, more supporters for the Cobb family, and moving forward, they are calling for sort of a peaceful approach yeah. to this because, as we've seen um, in other cases, things can get pretty fiery. Yeah, the city, you know, still continues to reel yeah. in the aftermath of George Floyd and um, no that's an important message and they have they have sort of been there been mm -hmm. been been on that um, you know kind of messaging if you will yeah. since it happened because this happened July 31st so we yeah. are six seven months uh, beyond that and now we move forward so just uh, to run down what's next is uh, there's a scheduling conference coming up uh, in a couple weeks uh, I did see one filing today that uh, Trooper Longigan does not want to attend that. It's, it's kind of a bookkeeping thing. Okay. The two sides will discuss, you know, when we want to come back. Uh, there are several motions on the table, a motion to dismiss. Uh, other motions will obviously be forthcoming, this motion about uh, what the state wants to do in seeking an ad aggravated sentence. So these, these will have to be argued out. So they'll set a scheduling, you know, uh, schedule, like when do you, when, 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 when does the defense have to get their paperwork in, when does the state respond, and then the next actual court hearing where we probably would see Ryan Lange again again is April 29th it's called an omnibus hearing and that is uh, you know where they they go deep into the arguments yeah. and, and the stuff that will be on the table at that point we just have one minute left and I'm curious you've covered so many court cases over the years what stands out to you in this one as just yeah. being really 
interesting, different, uh, and, and moving forward? Well, the law enforcement support. I've covered a lot of these, yeah. you know, even down to, you know, years ago, there was a Minneapolis assault case against a police officer who fired into a car at from Hamilton. Never have seen the physical mm. presence of law enforcement there. It says a lot to me. Um, these fast issues that have come out already, you know, motion to dismiss, messing with the grand jury. It really is, in this case, Amy, it's, it really depends what lens you're looking at yeah. it. It, it. You know, what, what do 12 jurors say once yeah. they get in that box if this case gets to trial? All right, Paul, thanks so much for your insight. Uh, stay tuned to Fox 9, fox9.com for the very latest on this case. Thanks for watching.